see in the house of the Lord this, I guess you could call it a dreary Sunday morning, a rainy Sunday morning. But, you know, God knows what we need. If we didn't get a little bit of rain, a little bit of overcast skies once in a while, we wouldn't appreciate the sunny days, would we? So we're thankful that you made your way out to the house of the Lord this Sunday morning. If you're watching by way of Facebook Live or through YouTube, we welcome you to Clover Baptist Church. You're not here in the sanctuary this morning with us, but I hope that the Lord is in your sanctuary. Amen. And that's what the song just sang about. You know, we have a sanctuary where we meet together to worship God, and we know that His Spirit is always here. But hopefully when you leave, you carry Him away with you in your sanctuary, in your life, in your body. And that's what that song was just singing about a minute ago. But we are glad you're here this morning, and uh, there are some announcements that we want you to pay attention to in the bulletin today. We are still trying to reach our goal for our international missions offering. We received the Lottie Moon Christmas offering during the month of December, and we continue, hopefully, till we get the goal met. But uh, if you still have something to contribute, please feel free, and I encourage you to do that as well. So remember that. We've got the Mission Action Group going to be meeting at 11 o'clock this Wednesday to pray together and study the Word of God and learn more about missions. And the Bible study group is going to be meeting at 4 o'clock on Thursday. And then Wednesday night, we invite you to be here at 7 o'clock as we come together for our midweek prayer meeting. And bring your Bible along with you because we'll be looking into the Word of God together as we start a brand new year of Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting. And uh, we haven't done a Baptist Men's Day in quite a few years, but in our Brotherhood meeting on Wednesday evening, we decided that we'd like to do that again. So the information is there in the bulletin for you. And uh, I'm going to have a sign-up sheet next week will be out there so that you can sign up if you are a man who plans to come and eat the breakfast. You say, you mean women aren't allowed? You wouldn't be a Baptist man if you were a woman. You'd be a Baptist woman, right? So this is for the men. So this is going to be the last Sunday in the month of January. We'll meet together in the fellowship hall for breakfast at 8 o'clock. We'll have some time to pray, maybe share some testimonies and enjoy some fellowship. And then Boyd's going to be leading an all-male choir in our worship service. So men, even though you may not be a part of the choir today, you will be on the last Sunday of the month, okay, because we need your voice. And then in February, we traditionally have Women's Day in the church where we recognize the ministry of our women and, and honor them as well. So remember that upcoming event, if you would. I am working on a script for an Easter drama, and I do it with fear and trembling because, as we know, we're hearing an increase in the case of COVID rising again. But I'm just going to trust God that we're going to be able to do some of the things we haven't been able to do for a while. And uh, we're going to make an effort. So uh, thank you for being with us. If you've been away, we're glad you're back this morning. But we have a lot to pray about today as we go before the Lord in prayer. Remember to pray for the Johnny Phillips family. Many of us knew Johnny. He delivered for UPS here to the church quite a bit. And I have tried during my ministry here to encourage you to be a witness. And uh, Johnny would pass by my house quite often. And in the summertime when he'd see me working, I would wave at him and try to slow him down to get some help. And so in October, I was at Johnny Wilson's farm, and Johnny was working there. He is retired from the UPS, and we struck up a conversation. And uh, I said, well, Johnny, I said, you know, you hadn't stopped to help me. He said, one day, preacher, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to help you and shock you to death. And I said, okay, that'll be great. And I said, do you know I've got a pacemaker in my heart now? And he said, no, I didn't know about that. And I shared some of the insight about it. But I said, Johnny, you know, the main thing, is that whenever it's our time, we're ready to go. And you say, what does that mean? The conversation gave me such great hope and joy when I heard that he had been called home to be with the Lord. He said, preacher, I made that arrangement a long time ago. I know where I'm going, and I'm glad that I'm ready. And folks, you never know when you have a conversation with somebody how that may come back to comfort you in the years that go by. So do pray for his wife and his daughter. She's expecting her first child, his first grandchild, in a week. So I know it's a difficult time for the Phillips family. Please pray for them. Remember the little Cole. I better not call him little. I baptized him last Sunday. He's a young man. Cole, if he's watching, I'll get a letter probably. Cole Banks had surgery on his foot this week, and he's going to be... Uh, 
under the weather for quite a while, then awaiting another surgery on the other foot. So pray that he can get along real well. Recovery will be uh, very bearable, and he'll soon be well and strong again. Remember Alan Scholl as he's still recovering from shoulder surgery. And Miss Hazel Dishman and Miss Georgia Reese both have some ongoing health concerns. We want to be faithful to lift them to the Lord as we pray as well. And Logan's at home not feeling well this morning. And Deb Benfield's at home not feeling well. There will be no children's church today because she was going to be the children's church worker. And we want you to come to church. But if you're sick, you probably really need to stay home to prevent spreading things. And, you know, if you sneeze or you cough, people go berserk. They say, oh, they've got COVID. I just want to give you a little medical insight. There is such a thing as the common cold. There is bronchitis. There's allergies. There's sinusitis. There's pneumonia. There's fat. Don't get that. <laughs> I mean, if you've got something that's contagious, for your sake and everybody else's, you need to isolate yourself. Do you all agree? But in, uh, who was that cough back there? Uh, <laughs> anyway, I just, I just feel like we ought to use some common sense. What do y'all think? That goes a long way. So do remember those that are sick, those that are not able to be with us, and uh, pray for them this morning as we call on the Lord together. The greatest need of all is the need of a Savior. So we need to remember those that are lost without Jesus, those that are away from God, and uh, those that are unchurched right now, our nation, we are in a mess. Uh, I've learned a new phrase. Our world is upside down right now. And only God can turn it right side up. So we need to pray to him. Remember our missionaries and our military. Maybe you have an unspoken request you'd like to share with an upraised hand this morning as well. Aren't you glad that you have a faithful God who loves you and cares for you, who hears and answers your prayer? Why not stand and give folks an opportunity to make their way to an altar if you'd like to come and pray? And uh, we've got some in our church that do have COVID that have been out for a couple of weeks. And I've been checking with them on the phone. Improvements are coming. And so we just want to pray for each other today. And God knows the need even before we ask. Children, I'll give you a heads up. Miss Becky will be back there for Children's Church after the special music this morning as well. Let's bow together as we call on the Lord and remember each other in prayer. Father, we do want to humble ourselves before you. We've read in your word the promise that you've made. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from their wicked ways, then you will hear in heaven... You will forgive our sins and you will heal our land. So, Father, we cling to that promise this morning. We humble ourselves realizing that we are nothing and that you are God, that we need your help. I ask, Lord, that we would repent of the way that we have shunned you and the sin that we've allowed to creep into our lives. Father, just hear and answer the prayers of your people today. We pray for the lost that they might be saved. We pray for those that are backslidden that they might See the need to turn around and come back into fellowship with you where they'll find your joy is full and abundant and free. Father, we pray for the sick that, Lord, according to your will, you might touch and heal them and raise them up. Father, where grace is needed, we're glad that you have abundant grace to supply. We do pray for our military, our missionaries. We pray for our school systems, our teachers, our staffs. We pray for everyone that... Uh, is working to try to help our country come back to where it needs to be. Lord, let it begin by a great revival sweeping over our souls. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would comfort the bereaved and lift up the fallen. Father, the many unspoken requests, we know that you know them by name. So, Father, we lay them before you, praying that you would hear and answer according to your will. Bless this time of worship together. May you be uplifted. May the church be edified. And may we all be strengthened in our faith. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So you return to your seat. Wave at somebody. Let them know you're glad to see them in the house of God this morning. Good morning.
I thought the choir sounded really good on the opening, did you not? So let's sing again. Today is tomorrow. We're going to sing happy birthday to our pastor here. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Is it Pastor Keith, preacher? We got the idea. Let me just set the record straight, though. Uh -oh. I had gotten my wife a Christmas gift, and it had a hole in it, so I had to take it back to the store to exchange it yesterday. And the lady asked how I was doing. I said, well, I'm getting older. And uh, I said, by the way, Monday's my birthday. And she said, well, how old will you be? I said, well, how old do you think I will be? And she said, 60. I said, thank you. And I said, 69. She said, oh. She said, my husband's 61, and I thought you looked younger than him. And I thought, well, that's good. And so last night we had dinner with some real good friends, and there was a man standing after the meal had been paid for, and uh, the lady was asking, 
And I said, well, I want to be turning a year older uh, Monday. And she said, how old will you be? I said, I'll be 69. And she said, that's not bad. And there's a man standing over there. He said, you look younger than I am, and I'm 55. <laughs> That's you true. don't look it, I will agree. Honestly, I will agree with that. And I tell you, we are glad to have him back around here for another year. You know, in all sincerity, we know that he had some health issues going on here over the last few years uh, and things, but we are just glad that the Lord has kept you around and most of all kept you as our pastor here Thank for you. another year. So we appreciate I'd rather have you. a pacemaker as a new car. I told you what the new car was going to be. A pacer. So. <laughs> That's working. That's working. Thank y'all. Uh, you stand as we sing here this morning, Victory in Jesus. simply remind you of something I've been taught all my life. It's better to give than to receive. So this is our opportunity to show our love and our appreciation to the Lord by giving in a tangible way. And you know, scripturally, all he asked for is 10%. Do you know he could have asked for 90% and left us with 10, couldn't he? So let's give with a cheerful heart. 
Earl, but before we do, I want you to look at that third verse. Okay. We're going to sing it again. Go ahead and and there on. should be smiles on everybody's faces. Amen. Look at the words of this verse when you see it. And when you sing it here. Just think about what is waiting for us. Amen. One day up there in heaven. So we're going to do it again here. Most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, it's such an honor to come back to your house today, dear Lord, and worship your holy name. Father, we just thank you for your son who died on that old rugged cross to give us all eternal life, dear Lord. Father, I pray for the lost out there, dear Lord. Father, I lift them up to you and ask you to help them find their way to find you, dear Lord, Father. Father, we just know that you are the only way, the true light, dear Lord, in our world today, dear Lord. In this old ugly world today, Father, we know that you can bring all the peace and glory to all. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity as it's ours to come back and give portion to you that you give to us, Father. Father, we ask you to be at the pastor as he brings us a message. Let's give us ten ears to hear, and let's go out through the community and just spread your word, dear Lord. For all these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
I'm tired and so weary, but I must go along. Tell the Lord, come on, gracious. How do I go back to you? <clears throat> well, y'all are fixing to sing a hymn instead of me up here. Well, I'm tired and so weary, but I must go along till the Lord comes and calls me away where the morning so bright and the lamb is the light and the night night I'm nowhere near that you know y'all gonna hear Beulah Land but no music <laughs> I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before. No sad goodbyes will there be spoken for time won't matter anymore Beulah land I'm longing for you and someday tell you what, if you can sing like that, you don't need no music, no way, right? Thank you. What a blessing. Well, I'm in my 18th year here as your pastor, and I still stand amazed when I look at the talent God has placed in this little church. Uh, we are blessed. We are gifted, and we ought not to take that for granted. 
And if somebody blesses your heart, you ought to let them know that. Uh, God gets all the glory. But it's nice for somebody once in a while to say, I appreciate your ministry. I appreciate your voice. I appreciate your being willing to use your voice to glorify the Lord. Thank you. Don't worry about that little technical glitch there. That was all man-made. But what you shared with us was God-made. Amen. Well, this morning I'm going to read an entire chapter in the book of Acts, chapter number 10. And it's not very often that you'll find me using an entire chapter. And it's a lengthy chapter. But I've got some things to share with you that God has shared with me. And I hope that I have uh, put together some slides that will be shared before we read the scripture that will help you uh, understand and grasp it. It doesn't matter how long you have been saved. It doesn't matter how many times you've read through the Bible. There's always more for us to learn. And some days you'll read something that you've read a thousand times and it looks brand new to you. Uh, it's just as fresh as the morning paper, except it's not full of lies, okay? But uh, somebody told me one time, said, Preacher, you don't ever need to study. You graduated from Bible college. There's a Greek word for that statement. Hogwash. No matter how long you've been saved, no matter how much you've learned, there's still far more for you to know than what you already know. And sometimes it'll almost scare you to think about how little you really do know. We're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit this morning. And I simply titled my message, which I don't always do, The Holy Spirit is Speaking, Are You Listening? The problem is not a problem with the Holy Spirit. The problem is a problem with our spirit being able to identify and hear when he speaks. So on the slide, you're going to see uh, the, the Latin word, which is trinatus. And the word trinity is taken from the Latin word trinatus. And it means three each, triple, or threefold, combined with I-T-Y speaks of unity and oneness. The word Trinity doesn't appear in the King James translation of the scripture, but the teaching of the Trinity is there throughout. Even in the very beginning, God said, let us make man in our own image. The us is plural. The us stood for God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And some people would say, well, the Trinity is referring to the triune God, which it is, three in one. And that is hard for us to figure out. It's hard for us to understand how God can be three persons, but he is. There is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I'll use a couple of illustrations to maybe help reinforce that understanding. I've had young people, I've had children ask me at the door after a sermon, how can God be three different people? Well, there's a lot of things I can't explain, and that's one of them. But I can give you an illustration. My name is Keith. I am a husband, I am a father, and I am a son. But when you put all three of them together, I'm still Keith. All right? Eggs. All of us. I started to do a little... Thing today, I, I thought about boiling an egg and bringing one that was raw and see if Chris would catch him. But then I thought, no, that would be distracting. Because he'd be wondering, am I getting the one that's been cooked or am I getting the raw one? But look at an egg with me for a minute. An egg is an egg, right? But an egg has three parts. It has a shell, it has a yolk, and it has a white. But it's still an egg even though it is three in one, just as Keith is three in one. So it is with the Trinity. In one, we have God the Father, we have God the Son, we have God the Holy Spirit. As we move on to the next slide, we're going to see that uh, I'm going to give you a disclaimer. Do you all know what a disclaimer is? I put the definition up there for you. A disclaimer is a statement that denies something especially responsibility. For example, the novel carries the usual disclaimer about the characters being no relation to living persons, you know. 
And sometimes people say, well, I know who they were using as their characters, people that I know. Sometimes there's a similarity there, but in the disclaimer, it's making it clear that these are all fictional people. It's not real people. When you watch uh, the advertisements about medications, I'll be honest with you, it's a wonder that we take anything because they'll tell you what it's good for, but then in the disclaimer, it say it may cause a heart attack, it may cause blood clots, it may cause you to lose your mind, you know? Uh, that's a disclaimer. Well, I'm gonna share a disclaimer with you right now. In the next slide, it's gonna tell you what that disclaimer is. God may never send an angel to speak to you. God may never give you a vision to show you a message and God may never allow you to see a handwriting on the wall, but one thing I can say with 100% assurance and accuracy is if you are really and truly saved, God will speak to your spirit through the Holy Spirit. And you can rest upon that. Now, sometimes all of us would like for God to speak audibly to us. Haven't you asked God? God, just tell me what you want. Or God, just write it on the wall. Or God, just let me see it in a vision. Or let me catch it in a dream. Or send an angel to share the news like you did with Joseph and with Mary. God may not do any of those things, but I can tell you, if you're really saved and born again, the Holy Spirit will speak to your spirit. And God will use that to imply things and share things and instruct you in the ways that you need to be instructed. So we're going to follow on and look at the characters because there are a lot of people mentioned in Acts chapter 10. And I want you to understand who these are. That'll help you better grasp the meaning of the scripture. There's a man that we're going to be introduced to whose name is Cornelius. Cornelius was a centurion. That means that he was in a man in charge of a company or a band. He was in charge of the Italian band. But most importantly, he was a Gentile not a Jew, who believed in and who loved the Lord God of Israel. And he was charitable, the Bible says, and we'll see that in just a minute. So that's the first character you're going to be introduced to is Cornelius. And then we're going to meet someone called Simon Peter. Now we know more about Simon Peter than we do Cornelius because Simon Peter was a Jew. Simon Peter was one of the 12 disciples that followed after Jesus Christ and continued in the ministry in fact, Simon Peter, remember, is the one who denied the Lord three times. Remember, they said, you're one of his. No, I know nothing. He even cursed that he did not know Jesus as they were preparing to take him to the cross and crucify him. So you would call him a backslidden disciple, I would think. But this is hope for you and me. Even though we may have turned away from God, even though we may have disappointed God, even maybe we have backslidden on God, that doesn't mean that God has thrown us away. Because if you open your Bible to the beginning of Acts, you find that of all the people that God could have chosen to preach the powerful message at Pentecost, guess who it was? Simon Peter. The very one who had denied the Lord three times is the one that preaches the great Pentecostal message that God wanted him to preach. So that's two characters. Can you remember Cornelius, a centurion who was a Gentile, but yet he loved and believed God. And then Simon Peter, who was one of the disciples. And then there's another one, and this confuses it even more because his name is Simon. Simon the Tanner. Simon the Tanner was the one in whom Simon Peter lodged with in the city of Joppa. Joppa was about 30 miles away from where Cornelius was and where Simon Peter was lodging in the house of Simon the Tanner. And then you're going to see as we read through the scripture, there is an angel of God who spoke to Cornelius through a vision in verse number 3. Now, remember the disclaimer. This does not mean that God is going to speak to you through a vision. I'm not saying that he can't. I'm not saying that he won't, but he may not. But how is he going to speak to us? Through the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it's the angel of God who spoke to Cornelius in a vision in verse number 3. And then as we keep on reading, we see there's a voice that spoke to Simon Peter while he was in a trance, which is another word, experiencing a vision. It was the sixth hour, and the sixth hour in their time was noon. What do most of us like to do around noontime? We like to eat. 
And you're going to see that that plays into the events that are going to take place as we read in verse number 13. So that is another character that's in there. It's an unnamed voice that speaks to Simon Peter. And then as we continue to read, we see there are some, I guess if this were a uh, movie or a television program, you would probably say these are supporting actors, if you will. Uh, there were two of Cornelius' household servants, and there was a devout soldier that was used by Cornelius to be sent to Joppa to carry a message to Simon Peter, and that's in verse number 7. So I believe now we can start reading the Word of God together. We're starting in verse number 1, and I think that's all the slides I had ready. Is that not right, or is there another one? Oh, no, this is the most important one. I can't slip, skip it. Do you all remember who we looked at? We started off with the man who was a centurion who was a Gentile, and his name was Cornelius. And then we looked at one of the disciples whose name was Simon Peter, and then we saw the household that Simon Peter was staying in in Joppa was a man by the name of Simon the Tanner. And then we saw an angel of the Lord that appeared in a trance or a vision. And then we saw a voice, and then we saw what? the supporting actors who were two of the household servants of Cornelius and a devout soldier. But of all those, the most important one that we'll feature this morning is the Holy Spirit. So keep that in mind. Now, does that help y'all at all? We'll find out, won't we? All right, let's look into the Word of God. Chapter 10, you're going to be seated for a while, so I'm going to ask you to stand if you're able to stand, and this will keep your legs from going to sleep maybe and keep your minds awake. Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse number 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh to the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore you are come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house, and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. 
And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, and fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, You know how that it is unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation? But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying as soon as I was sent for. I ask therefore for what intent ye have sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. And thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. The word I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism with John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with a Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Father, would you open our eyes and stop our ears? And tenderize our hearts that we might hear your word and respond to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. It is a lengthy passage, but I'm hoping what I shared with you at the onset of the message helped you to follow the reading of the scripture and grasp some of the intent that it had and the content that it had. We find that here is a situation of a Jewish man who needs to hear the gospel and a Gentile man who needs to hear the gospel. You see, when Simon Peter came into the world and when Cornelius came into the world, they both had the same need. They needed the gospel. And so Simon Peter has received the gospel message and has been chosen of God to carry the message to the unsaved, which included this Gentile whose name, uh, this Gentile whose name was Cornelius. And so God is working through the Holy Spirit. Yes, we saw uh, an angel of the Lord. Uh, we saw a voice, all these things, a trance. But it was always the Holy Spirit who was at work on both ends. The Holy Spirit was working on Simon Peter to be ready to share the word. And the Holy Spirit was working on Cornelius to be ready to receive the word. You understand that? As I said, you may never see a vision, you may never have company with an angel, you may never hear that voice, but if you have been saved and born again, then the Holy Spirit dwells within you. You say, I don't know about that. 
The Bible promises us that when Jesus went away, he was going to send a comforter. And the Holy Spirit is known by, in my reading, it said there were 32 different names that were used interchangeably for the Holy Spirit. Uh, the most common is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and the Comforter. And remember when Jesus was preparing to ascend back into the heavens, he told his followers to wait, to tarry there until the Comforter was sent. And then, of course, they were in that upper room on the day of Pentecost when they were in filled with the Holy Spirit of God. When you were saved and born again, whether you acknowledged it, whether you recognized it, whether you knew it or not, somebody came into your heart to live. And that's the Holy Spirit. And he dwells within us. If you go back and study the Old Testament, you see that the Holy Spirit was not the abiding presence that you and I are fortunate to have in our lives today. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come for a season and then he would be removed. He would move on somebody to accomplish something, and when that was accomplished, the Holy Spirit would be withdrawn. Remember, there was a time when Peter actually prayed and begged God, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Well, there's a lot of things we have to pray for, but there's one thing you and I, as saved, born-again children of God, never have to ask. He's not going to take the Holy Spirit from us. He promised that he would abide with us even unto the very end of the world, the end of the age. And the Holy Spirit is our friend that guides us. I did go to Bible college. I've had seminary classes. But I want to tell you, when I pick up the Word of God to read the Word of God, do you know who my teacher is? The Holy Spirit. He opens my eyes to see things that otherwise I would not be able to see. When I feel impressed to witness, it's the Holy Spirit that prompts me. He gives me that unction if you will, that urge that I have to share, to tell. He also warns me about going in certain situations. If we would just open our hearts and listen when the Holy Spirit speaks, it would keep us out of a heap of trouble. Do you realize that? Young people, you need to be sensitive to what God is saying to you because God is your best friend. And if you're saved and born again, when you have that sensation in you, I ought not to read this, I ought not to look at this, I ought not to listen to this, I ought not to fellowship with this. That's the Holy Spirit trying to protect you, trying to keep you out of trouble. The problem is the Holy Spirit is speaking, but too many times we're just not listening. You realize that? You can't put the blame on him. You have to put the blame on ourselves. You know, my mom, I've told you this a million times, my mom said, Keith, you can tell your children what you want them to do, but you can't make them do it. And the same thing is true with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can guide us, can prompt us, can talk to us, can try to persuade us, but we have a choice of will, don't we? And we can either listen or we can reject. We can obey or we can disobey. And most of the problems we have in life is when we have disobeyed what the Holy Spirit has told us. You say, preacher, I just don't know whether it's right or wrong or not. There's another Greek word for that. Hogwash. If you're saved, you have the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit indwelling you. And he will guide you in the direction you should and should not go. Amen. He will open the scriptures to let you understand. A lot of people say, I don't read the Bible because I can't understand it. Well, you're not trying hard enough. If you will open it and take it at face value, and don't let people say, well, that's just your interpretation. I just simply believe God says what he means and God means what he says. Don't you? And if we would just do what we know to do is right, how much better our lives would be. And if we would refuse to do the things that we know we ought not to do. And I, I read a lot of people's posts on Facebook and stuff, and people have different opinions, and you know, opinions are just like belly buttons. Everybody's got one. But you can't listen to everybody's opinion because some opinions are, are warped. You know, and counsel. Uh, people will tell you in a heartbeat what they think you ought to do. But you know why they're so free with their advice? They don't have to live with the consequences. You're the one that has to deal with what happens. But you need to be careful who you listen to. 
who you read after, who you follow after. And so we find that the Holy Spirit is at work here in chapter 10. The Holy Spirit is working with Cornelius, and the Holy Spirit is working with Simon Peter. And God just miraculously through the Holy Spirit brings the two of them together. And did you see that when Simon Peter met with Cornelius, he knew that Jewish and Gentile do not mix. It was, is the word taboo? Does that mean it's wrong? It was wrong for someone who was Jewish to have fellowship with a Gentile. It was very wrong for them to even go into a house of a Gentile person. But do you remember the vision that God allowed Simon Peter to see where a sheet was let down that had all kind of animals on it? And remember, it was lunchtime, and I'm sure food was on his mind. You know, his stomach may have been growling. I don't know. But he's thinking about food, and he sees all this meat that's there in front of him, and the Word of God says, kill and eat. And what did he say? Not so, Lord. For I have never touched anything that's common or unclean. And you know, if you're reading the book of Moses, the five chapters, you see there were certain foods they could not partake of because they were viewed as unclean. And if you really do some study, um, a lot of that was really hygienic. Um, I love shrimp. Does anybody else like shrimp? The shrimp some of the filthiest meat you'll ever put in your mouth. You know, they eat off of everything that's in the bottom of the ocean. You know, they're, they're, it's not clean. But I can eat shrimp because I don't have to live under that old Mosaic law anymore because that has passed away. But he is rebelling against what God is telling him. It says that God had to tell him three times. Three times God had to repeat to him, don't call what I've told you to eat unclean or common. And so what he was doing is he was really giving him a picture about the Jews and the Gentiles, about the man Cornelius that he was going to meet. Because he was a Jew and he would have looked upon Cornelius, who was a Gentile, as being unclean, as being common. And you know, they were so proud that they really didn't think that they could become a believer unless they followed all the legalism and circumcision and everything the Jewish people followed after. But he said, don't call it common. Don't call it unclean. And he even makes reference to it when he meets with Cornelius. He says, I, I have been shown that I'm not to be a respecter of persons. And folks, the whole thing is this. Whether you approve of somebody, whether you like somebody, whether you dislike somebody, whether you disapprove of somebody or not, Jesus Christ can save them just like he saved you. They're just important to God as you're important to God. And so in the process then, he obeys God and he speaks to Cornelius. Did you read what he said to Cornelius? He preached the gospel to him. He told him about Jesus dying on the cross and being raised again. And then, of course, the result is that Cornelius and his whole household had put their faith in God, not just in the God, but in the God of Simon Peter and the God that you and I follow after. And the Holy Ghost came upon them. I'm just going to throw this in for good measure. If you do not have the Holy Spirit living in you, you are not saved. Did you hear me? He would not save you and keep you from having the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, it is impossible for you or me to live the Christian life. Right? That's the reason, and this is another message, but when the rapture takes place, the church is going to be taken out. The church is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The church is you and me if we're saved and born again. When we're taken out, the Holy Spirit will not be here on this earth to control people's wildness as it is now. I mean, we're living in some perilous times. Y'all agree with me, don't you? If you don't, you're wrong. We're living in some perilous times. I heard in New York this past week there was a politician that was saying, we're not going to prosecute someone if they break into a store and commit theft and they're armed, but they don't injure the person with the gun. 
we won't prosecute them. In California, you can go rob a place as long as you don't take over $999. No, yeah, $999. It has to be 1000 or more, or they'll just slap you on the wrist and let you go. And you wonder why in the world we're living in such a corrupt society? People know that they can commit all kind of crime and get away with it. I mean, really, I'm glad I don't live in California, and I'm glad I don't live in New York. How about you? But folks, wrong's wrong, and right's right. It always has been and always will be. But if you don't have that Holy Spirit controlling your life, you don't have God living in your life. And it's not about a religion. Some people would say it's just your Baptist theology. No, folks, that's the Bible. And it's, that's more important, Baptist theology. Isn't that right? What the Bible has to say about it is what really is going to count in the end. But it's not about what denomination I'm in. It's about a relationship that I have with Jesus Christ. What did he say to his disciples before he was preparing to leave this world? We sang about it a little bit ago. In my house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And what did he say? Thomas said, Lord, we don't know the way. What were Jesus' words? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Folks, if you're saved, you've got Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit living inside of you. If you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you cannot be one of his children. So we see in the closing verses that the Holy Spirit came down and abode on Cornelius and all of his household. Now, I want to throw this in for good measure because some people have the wrong idea. I'm going to walk a little bit. Is that okay? Just because Grandma was a good Christian lady doesn't mean you're one. Just because daddy went to heaven doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Folks, it's an individual choice that nobody can make for you. You have to accept Jesus for yourself, and that determines whether or not you make it to heaven or not. It's not because you're a good person that you're going to heaven. It's not because you're a bad person that you're going to hell. You're going to heaven because Jesus is your Savior and Lord, and you've repented of your sin and put your faith and trust in him. Or you're going to hell because you have rejected Jesus Christ and never put your faith and trust in him. That's the bottom line. It's not because I'm a Baptist. It's not because somebody's a Methodist or a Presbyterian. I believe there'll be some Roman Catholics in heaven, don't you? And God help us, I hope there'll be some Baptists up there. Amen? It's not about your religion. It's about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you know him, he knows you, and you're going to have a home in heaven when this life is over. And you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. What you need to do is start listening to him. Amen? Because he is speaking. Are we listening? I honestly believe that the biggest solution, a revival would be great, but if God's people would just start listening to the Holy Spirit, God's people, a lot of marriages would be spared from divorce and breakup if a husband and a wife would listen to the Holy Spirit. There's some things you cannot do, some things you should not do. And if you listen to the Holy Spirit, you won't do them, right? Kids, we're losing a generation. It's because people aren't listening to the Holy Spirit. Our country is upside down. Do you realize that? We are literally upside down today. And the only way we're going to get right is if we get right with God. And he's given us the companion, the comforter. We've got folks that have had to say goodbye to loved ones in recent weeks and months. In the last two years, there's been so much death. But the only way you're going to get through the grief is if you have the Holy Spirit to comfort you. I like that word, don't you? 
comforter. You know? And it's not so much what somebody says to you when you're going through some of these hard times in life. It's just knowing that they're going to be there with you. You know, I've studied a lot of grief courses, and I went through grief myself. About lost my mind, I guess. Some of you think I did, but I still got it. If it hadn't been for the Holy Spirit to be with me when I was all alone, I wouldn't have made it. I really wouldn't. I wouldn't be here. But he's not going to leave you alone. He's going to be there to hold you and to comfort you. And he'll get you through these rough times. I promise you he will. You say, preacher, how do you know? Because he's done it for me. And if he did it for me, he'll do it for you. We just need to start listening to the Holy Spirit. A lot of people are scared of the Holy Spirit. They're afraid, well, he might make me do something I shouldn't do. Well, if he want to make you do something, you ought to do it. Right? Some people just won't surrender their life for fear. Well, he's going to ask more of me than I'm going to want to give. Folks, think about what he did for you and me. There's nothing he can ask me to do that even begins to compare with what he did. Y'all realize that? And he was sinless. He had no wrong, no guile. Well, look at it. He didn't even have a germ in his mouth. But he died in our place and became sin because he loved us. So he's not going to ask you to do something any harder than what he's done for you. All right? I believe we all listen to the Holy Spirit. Boy, I don't usually point you in a direction, but I don't know that we've sung it here but once or twice since I've been here, but it's a song that's really a good song, and it really fits in with the message right now, and I hope it's in our hymn, The Holy Spirit, Breathe on Me. That's what we need. How many of you were in Sunday school this morning? Can I see your hand? Well, the rest of you should have been. Amen. We studied about the dry bones in Sunday school. Ezekiel was given a message from God to preach to a valley of dry bones. He asked him, he said, can these bones come back to life again? And he said, Lord, thou knowest. And of course, God miraculously brought the dry bones back to life, but they didn't have any breath. They were, the bones were together. The sinew and the flesh was on the bones again, but there was no breath. Well, folks, if you don't have breath, you don't have life. Did you realize that? And so what he did then was he called for the winds from the east, the north, the south, the west to blow and breathe life into those dry bones. And then it says those dry bones stood up. Folks, this is Sunday school for those of you who were backslidden this morning. But anyway, uh, he wasn't really talking about those bones coming to life. He was talking about the nation of Israel how it was dead and dried up and they needed a breath of life. And folks, that's what this song talks about. We need a breath of life from the Holy Spirit. You know, if we earnestly get on our face before God and just say, God, would you please breathe on me? I need you to guide me and empower me. I need to give myself to you totally, completely, 100%. Folks, it's not getting saved all over again. You can't get saved but one time. He does it right the first time, the only time. But sometimes we need to recommit ourselves to him when we get away from him. You know, people see us go away from God. It'd be great if they could see us come back to him, wouldn't it? What you need to do is do business with God. This altar is open this morning. If I need to pray with you, I will. If somebody needs to come pray with you, they will. But my friend, it may just be that you need to come and talk to the Lord. If you'll listen to what the Holy Spirit's saying to you. The Lord's going to come and lead us as we sing. I invite you to pray and be ready to respond as he would have you to. He's speaking. Are we listening? Father, have your will and your way. Don't let us leave in the same shape that we came into. In Jesus' name, amen. Pages at point.
y'all put your books away right now. And I've been a preacher for a long time. And I've sat under preachers that have been preachers much longer than I have. And I've heard them tell their stories, looking back through their ministries. Some of the stories have sad endings and some of the stories have good endings. It's always a matter of choice. I heard a preacher talk about somebody being under conviction during a worship service. And the preacher knew they were under conviction. It was obvious. It was very evident. The preacher knew what was going on in their life. And I'm glad I don't know what's going on in all your life. It would scare me to death, probably. But God always knows. And he said he had made a visit with that person. And he said the person had the attitude, that preacher's not going to move me. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Unfortunately, that fellow waited too long. The preacher had to end up doing his funeral. Folks, this is just my philosophy. God's either going to straighten you up or he's going to straighten you out, one of the two. You get what I'm saying? Did you hear what that verse and that, I don't have a hymn book in front of me, it says, my stubborn will subdue. Folks, being too stubborn can be your downfall. What does he say? We need to humble ourselves. Some people just don't know how to say those little words, I'm sorry. Some people don't know how to say those simple words, please forgive me. Some people don't know how to say, I was wrong. Stubbornness will drive you to an early grave sometimes. And it will separate you from God. I'm going to ask him to lead that one verse one more time. You say, preacher, who are you talking to? Might be you. I don't know. I'm just relaying the message God told me to relay. So the Holy Spirit's speaking. The question mark again is, are you listening? Would you respond? I say everything I say out of love for you, love for the Lord. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Hallelujah. I deserved hell more than anybody else. But he kept me from it by giving his son. Would you sing that one verse? I'm going to go to the back, but if I see you coming forward, I'm going to come back up here. as we know how for that person. Lord, we pray that the conviction fall upon them. Father, we pray that they yield to that conviction. Father, before they get out the door this morning, and Lord, if they make it out the door, may it be at their house this afternoon, but God, we just pray that they come to know you. And God, for those of us that are Christian here this morning, my God, you have blessed us. You have given us more than we deserve. Father, you have saved us from a sinner's hell. And God, we can't thank you enough for that and for sending your son Jesus to die on that cross for us. Now, Lord, as we go out of here this morning, may we not leave you in this building, Lord, but may we take you with us 
throughout the rest of this week. For all this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.